Let's start with our mom from North Carolina. Hi. Hello. Introduce yourself, um, your long COVID kid. And why don't you start by telling us when you first got COVID? Um, So I am a mom who lives in North Carolina. Um, My husband and I have two children. Um, When we contracted COVID, which was in June of 2022, so about a year and a half ago, um, at the time, my two children were five years old and almost two. Um, And we were all fully vaccinated, fully boosted, you know, whatever it was back then, um, taking all the precautions, masking indoors, the whole thing. And um, unfortunately, we got COVID through the youngest. My almost two-year-old had just started um, like a morning TOTS program, and she had only been there for six days. And unfortunately, she brought home COVID. And um, our five-year-old, we already knew was high risk. Um, And so um, the other three of us, you know, had sort of the more mild infections that people tend to have, Um, you know, Symptoms weren't so pleasant, but nothing severe. And as we expected, as we had been warned by her doctors, and as we knew, um, our five-year-old experienced a much more challenging um, experience, both during those symptoms for the two weeks, and then when things started popping up a couple weeks later. Do you mind me asking, what um, made your child high risk? How did you know? So our child... um, has a rare genetic auto-inflammatory disease um, that we had very, very recently gotten her diagnosis on. So we had lived a life where we had, you know, already started with a preemie in the NICU and massive amounts of sickness and illness and specialists and tests and labs. And by the time we even got to COVID, like our lives had been really, really hard. Um, And she had already an amazing team of specialists around her. So um, after the COVID infection, when certain symptoms started popping up or things got worse um, out of the blue, um, we sort of already had that team around us, unlike I think most people, to, to realize very quickly something was going on, there was a problem, and it wasn't any of the things she'd already brought to the table, it was new. Um, And because of that, it was very serious and it was alarming and we needed to get to other specialists right away for diagnosis and and, um, treatment. So we had a a bit of a unique experience because we were already starting starting at this from sort of with a high risk, vulnerable child that had a lot of medical issues already. Thank you. Cynthia, why don't you introduce yourself and um, tell us about your family's experience getting COVID? Hi, my name is Cynthia. I am from Northern Virginia. I have a son that has long COVID. He's eight now. We all got COVID in March 2020 when he was four. And it was very mild COVID. It was not any traditional symptoms, which made our journey a nightmare. So none of us had a cough, um, shortness of breath, or fever, which means that when we asked for testing, we were denied testing. Um, but I knew it was COVID because it was, what else would it be that the whole family is sick from right when the country is shut down. And so that is when we actually had like just mild COVID for maybe like two days. It felt like, like a light sinus infection. Um, but then it went away. And so we're like, okay, we don't have to worry about anything. And we did what everyone else was doing, which is ordering, you know, from our favorite restaurants and baking banana bread (laughs) and going for walks in the park. Um, But then I started feeling kind of weird. And then his dad started feeling kind of weird to the point where he thought he was having a heart attack. And I was like, April. And he went and got seen. Sorry, he had a heart attack? No, he thought he was. Um, He was having palpitations, um, high heart rate. When got seen by a doctor, they put him on what I now we now know is a bed blocker, right? <laughs> um, and said it was his age and weight went on his way. But then, you know, in May 2020, um, I developed widespread symptoms that we now know as mast cell activation syndrome. Basically, I became allergic to all food, water, um, overnight. Um, ended up going into starvation. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. They thought maybe on gallbladder. Almost died several times. In that time that I'm slowly dying and then no one knows what's happening to me um, and I'm losing my mobility, I'm talking to my mom and she's playing with my son. She's like, he's a little more tired than usual. Like, I want to play with him, play soccer, but he just doesn't have a lot in him. And I was like, wow, that's really strange. 
I know I'm super tired from this, but I just figured I was tired from, I don't know, starvation. So I couldn't put two to do together. I just didn't know, like, but it didn't seem alarming. And so time went on, and I was like, okay, well, he seems okay, and that's fine. And then, you know, as I'm continuing the struggle in and out of the hospital, he seems fine. And then fast forward to around, around 2022, when we believe we got reinfected, from me having to leave the home in order to to have a safe environment and, and breathe during one of my flares and my reactions um, at a hotel stay, and because we were we were completely homebound at this point, so it was the only one reason why. So it was really like two weeks after we came back from that hotel stay, where he just walked up to me. And he was just very tired, and I remember him trying to brush his teeth, and he had to like sit down to brush his teeth. I was like, that is so strange. That's not my bubbly boy that I know. And then he was like, oh, I just feel like I'm having double heartbeats. And that's when I, the person who has thought this is anomia now, diagnosed at that point, was like, oh, I know what this is. <laughs> I know exactly what this is. But strangely, he also developed these things like tics, um, these involuntary movements, these, these strange sounds that he was happening when he was playing. If you know my child, he's a very quiet player. And it was just very, very strange. And I was like, oh, no, I know what this is. This is feeling like pants. This is feeling like um long COVID and I just had to accept that that was long COVID and he's had a few players um ever since and he has not been the same since that day um yeah so I just want to recap here for a second you were very very sick right it sounds like you were I mean you said you were starving because of MCAS which is is a thing and I just want to bring it back for the audience. So MCAS is, is a comorbid condition. It is mast cell activation syndrome. Um, it happens in adults. It can happen for children too. This is a diagnosis for children as well. Um, and so that is, that is something that the long COVID community also deals with. And then another condition that was mentioned is dysautonomia, which is a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. In the adult population, I know there's some studies that put it at like 87% of people who have long COVID have dysautonomia. And there is a condition under the umbrella of dysautonomia called POTS. And that is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. We do see it in children. It is diagnosed often in teenagers. Um, there is no diagnostic criteria for little ones. I do want to highlight that our kids still have the symptoms. Um, the fact that there is no diagnostic criteria is a barrier to care right now. And we definitely need more research on that. Um, and Megan, can I add one you? thing? Mm -hmm. um, I forgot to mention that um, for my child. So after, you know, after the two weeks of her COVID symptoms and she seemed fine, a little tired, but, you know, seemed fine. We sent her back to preschool and it was about three to five weeks later, um, suddenly one morning, she was on the floor and she told me that she couldn't walk. And um, I blew it off because have you, you know, have you met a five-year-old? <laughs> um, so I blew it off. You're fine. You're fine. And she seemed a little tired Senator her preschool. And um, her preschool teacher at the time, who was absolutely fantastic, um, you know, knew her very well, was always very on top of all of her medical issues, contacted me during the day that day to say that she seemed off, that she seemed to be struggling a little bit with like balance and walking. And again, I sort of was like, it's probably nothing as I mean, we have dealt with so far worse before. Um, but just as a precaution, I called our pediatrician and, um, you know, left a message, wanted their feedback. Should I be concerned or not? And went to pick her up, brought her home. When I got home, I'll never forget, you know, walking into the family room and she was on the floor um, telling me, you know, mommy, I can't walk. And I was I, again, I thought she was sort of playing. And um, she told me she described it as my legs feel bendy. Like her legs, she couldn't, she couldn't support herself on her legs. And at that point, that was when I was like, something's really wrong. And um, thank God, you know, our pediatrician happened to call us back right at that point. And I was describing and he said, bring her in right now. And I got her there and he did a neurological, just, I guess, whatever a baseline neurological evaluation is, which she failed. And this is a child who had never, ever had any neurological problems. It was like, I always joked it was like the one specialist we didn't have and he knew enough about 
her medical history and put two and two together that she, you know, had that COVID infection about three to five weeks earlier or something like that um, and said she needs to see neuro now. And um, I, I was still a little bit like in denial, like, really, you think it's that serious? She sort of seems fine. He's like, no. And he put it in his urgent and we were able to see a pediatric neurologist the next day. And um, again, I think without having, a, you know, a preschool teacher that was very attuned to her, letting me know, and then me putting together, oh, I'd seen that thing that morning. And then the preschool teacher called me too. And so I put it together. And then the pediatrician knowing her so well in her history, again, it took all of that for even all of us to be like, oh, something's really wrong and it's new and it's different. And it's not something we've dealt with before. Um, and so it was I don't know if I'll ever forget it, but like, thank God for all of that that was already in place, because I fear without it, we'd be like probably so many families who have no idea for a year because their pediatricians, are, they're fine, they're fine. And they're not getting it. And then by the time you realize they need a specialist, then we were at a six month wait. And then by the time we see them, it's a year and a half later. And at that point, we've lost early intervention. And so I think the reason that my my daughter currently is doing much better, I mean, we're not 100%, but much, much better is because we got that very quick, fast intervention. Right. I want to highlight, because you mentioned legs. Her, the first thing she said to you was legs. So that's very common in our community that one of the first things kids will set comment on is something about their legs. So she said what her legs felt bendy. Is that right? And then um, we have a lot of kids who will say um, it feels like their legs don't work or that their legs feel heavy or um, they're having trouble moving their legs. And a lot of times that's an expression of fatigue. Um, That's an expression of um, blood pooling, which is a symptom of POTS. Like they can feel something happening in their legs that feels different. So, you know, one of the things for any parent or doctor that's listening to this is just the way kids talk about their symptoms is radically different than how adults, they don't have the vocabulary. They don't have the language of illness um, to really explain like, you know, a four and five-year-old don't know fatigue, right? So they're going to tell you their legs feel heavy or (laughs) because to them they can't run or they're having trouble walking. So that's like, well, there's something wrong with my legs. Um, so before we move on, I did want to get what PANS meant. So PANS is Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. Um, so it's an autoimmune disorder, and it is associated with long COVID as well as other infections. And um, we're getting reports just nationally that there's a lot of, there's, you know, we're in a mental health crisis for a lot of various reasons. Um, But I do want to put that on everybody's radar as a possibility that it could be neuroinflammation because a lot of our kids, you know, it takes a very long time usually to get the PANS diagnosis. And that's, you know, there is treatment, there is intervention, there are things to do. And so um, it should be one of the possibilities considering over 90% of kids have had COVID at this point. So to consider that. Um, Cynthia, do you want to add anything to that? Because I saw you nodding your Yeah, head. yeah, so much of that. So um, one of my nephews has long COVID and it took, even though she's watching this, you know, my sister's been watching this for three years, <laughs> seeing this and seeing this in myself and in my son, It took her a year to figure out that he has long COVID too. Um, You know, he's showing signs of mass activation syndrome and having those those allergies that just popped up. The whole food group's gone overnight, unable to be active, suddenly struggling to remember school, went to the top of the class, just suddenly struggling to remember homework. Um, A kid that was so enthusiastic about learning and and everything suddenly just doesn't have the energy, um, doesn't have the focus, doesn't have the memory doesn't have the cognitive ability to really do what they've been doing for a long time and thriving. And it's really hard um, to, to figure it out. I, I've always maintained that I feel so lucky. I've had severe POTS, severe MCAS, um, severe MCFS early on because the second and day that I saw that in him, I was like, oh, I know what this is, especially when he's telling me about that. And I was able to do those early inventories that I know you can do at home 
while I was waiting those months and months and months and months to see a specialist. Um, and that's why he's as well as he is today to get worse. So can you remind me again, when he first had the POTS like symptoms, how old was he and what was the symptom? Um, dad had to be at six when he, I'll never forget that morning because I was, I was super sick in his room, hold up in his room. Um, and he came in to brush his teeth and he couldn't even get to the little stool to the sink. He couldn't even get up it. He had to stop and sit down on that stool and rest just from the bedroom that he came from to there. And he's like, I'm so tired. My legs feel heavy. I'm, I'm just so tired. And he looked tired. Like he, I could just tell like his color was not there. His energy was not there. He was just waist up, ready to take on the world. And he's just dragging himself. And I'm like, this is not my boy. This is this is not my kid. He said he said he felt like he was having double heartbeats. He said he was very tired and that his legs felt heavy. I was like, oh. So, for people who may not know, how do we know that's a difference? Um, that's not fatigue. That was like just I'm tired. That was a symptom of like POTS, which is a neurological condition. And the red flag is he sat down, right? Mm-hmm. He sat down. Six year old sitting better. down before you get to to brush your teeth. Like that's not know what. It's gonna play a the heart. He sat down, and then usually you feel I have pots as well. So usually you feel like a little bit of relief because the blood's not pulling in your legs anymore. And so that's kind of how we are like. That's a clue that that's pots and should be explored. Um, so people know that's how we know it's not. You're just tired. And I also want to highlight here something that's really important that you're saying because you know your child, right? So you keep mm-hmm. saying, that's not my child. That's, this is not normal. And that's really important. A lot of parents don't know as much about these conditions as Cynthia, because Cynthia had the conditions herself. So the advice we give to parents is to document the symptoms. So anytime you're like, that doesn't seem right, like that's different. Um, basically, what we suggest is that you keep an observational journal, kind of if you've ever taken biology 101, kind of like a scientific observational journal where you just literally write down your observations. Um, and then we also encourage you to kind of look through your five senses. Like, what do you see? What are you hearing? What is your child seeing? What is your child hearing? Also, what are you smelling? What are you tasting? Because these are two long COVID symptoms that children aren't necessarily going to come and say, I can't smell, right? So sometimes if something's starting going off, it's oftentimes good to kind of check if they can smell, if they can taste as well. Um, So Rochelle, when you knew your child had long COVID, you already had a care team in place. And they took it very seriously. They did. And, And to be fair as well, like, what we later what the neurologist later figured out, you know, even even before she got an actual long COVID diagnosis, which she does now have um, like in her medical chart. But even before that, what ha- what they figured out happened is COVID turned on additional symptoms for a second disease we didn't know she had. And so it's not just that I'm she there. has. Yeah, I was there because I don't think people know that. So when you say turned on, what do you mean? So. A lot of people, you know, we, for example, we know about, you know, genetic mutation I carry and my husband carries, which is why my child has a rare disease in the first place. So we're talking about a family that's already been through extensive genetic testing, but most people haven't. So we're all carriers for all kinds of things. You know, if we've ever had grandparents or parents that have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or diabetes, and we know these things sort of tend to run in our family, um, what what is happening, I mean, I've heard this from both my personal doctor and some of her doctors is, you know, maybe your grandparent had a certain disease in their 60s. Well, you carry the genetic underpinnings of that and it's just getting turned on much earlier, decades earlier from a COVID infection um, because they know that for a lot of autoimmune stuff, generally it's it's infection triggered that'll turn it on, right? I mean, it could be COVID, it could be something else, but with all the COVID going on and the mass uptick in it, it was likely from COVID. Um, and so what happened was she had been experiencing um, symptoms for years and we knew about one disease. We couldn't quite figure out what these other symptoms were. COVID came along, turned on some additional symptoms, which again, with the neural, we'd never had, she'd never had. And that's how they figured out, oh, she's got this second disease as well. And 
you know, one could say, oh, well, you know, she would have always had that disease. Okay, true, but she would have never had this symptom. And this symptom is a particularly debilitating symptom. So it would have been preferable for her to go throughout life not experiencing that the additional things COVID had turned on. And I think sometimes, um, I know for a lot of us, when we hear things like, oh, well, it's only, you know, COVID's only bad if you have pre-existing conditions. Colleen's, uh, that's a lot of people, first of all. And second of all, life's hard enough, right? I mean, you talk about rare chronic diseases, chronic illness for kids. It's hard. It was hard before COVID. COVID just came along and just made it all worse. And so, um, you know, we we are doing our absolute best to, to prevent another COVID infection because we know from the long COVID community that oftentimes that first infection comes along really weakens them, but they, you know, it takes a lot of work. They get back up, they get back up. And then that second one comes along and right. So we're trying to avoid that to the best of our ability. Um, But yeah, we are incredibly lucky that we have that care team in place. Um, And I think what a lot of people are not realizing, um, you know, the reason right now that there's six to 12 months waits for pediatric specialists in this country is because there is so much demand and there is so much demand more than usual because COVID turned stuff on in kids that maybe it would, would have never gotten turned on, maybe it would have gotten turned on in their 20s or 30s or 40s when it's more common, but all of a sudden it's happening in like really young children and it's it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with. Right, so I'm gonna pause here for a second. Um, so let's talk about what long COVID is for a moment, because it just occurred to me that we're talking about autoimmune conditions, and I don't think a lot of people would associate autoimmune conditions with long COVID. So I, I want to take a step back for a moment. So long COVID is simply an umbrella term. Um, they haven't quite, researchers are still trying to figure out how we want to diagnose it. But the way long COVID family uses the term, it's an umbrella term for anything that's triggered or associated with COVID. Um, So under that umbrella are things like syndromes, which are simply a constellation of symptoms um, that are infection associated, but we don't actually know the underlying mechanism. We don't know how they work, right? That's what a syndrome is. And so that would be things like POTS, MCAS, um, ME-CFS, um, those would be the associated syndromes. Also under long COVID, autoimmune conditions, okay, because it's turning on autoimmune conditions. Um, diabetes, it's triggering diabetes in lots and lots of children. Um, it's triggering neurological conditions we don't have names for right now. So What's the, what, what is the condition? Again, I have my own brain fog issues, but it starts, it's a, it starts first words G, second words B. I will look it up in a second. I can see it. I'll look it up in a second. You're talking about Gillian Barre? Yeah. Say it again. Uh, Gillian Barre. That's it. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of long COVID kids that have the symptoms, but then when they're tested, they're not testing positive. So it's something we don't quite understand what's going on, but a lot of our children have it. Um, So it is kind of this wide range of things. We're also seeing kids whose immune systems just are wonky. Um, Our kids seem to get sick more often. um, And when they get sick, it seems to take longer to recover, right? Um, And there's still a lot we just don't know. So I I just want to say real quick with parents, like we don't know a lot. so in, in pediatric research, I would say is about two years behind adult research. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One of which it's just harder to enroll kids in studies. It takes longer. You know, it's it just um, it's harder to study kids. So the research is actually even behind what we know about adults. And so I just want to remind everybody, this is really, really new. To continue the conversation, um, Cynthia, can you tell me, so after you realize, uh oh, this is long COVID, can you kind of tell me what your child's medical journey has been? Yeah, it's been a nightmare, a complete total nightmare, especially as a person that's disabled from long COVID itself. Um, I still, at three years in, am still trying to find a good neurologist for myself. Finding them care that's knowledgeable and safe, very difficult because of the wait list. Um, and I don't feel like ethically I should be using my work that I do with advocacy 
to get me access to things that the average person can't. So I'm doing this the hard way, just like any other parent. I'm not trying to skip lines. I'm not trying to say, hey, do me a favor, whatever. Because I know, one, um, I just find it unethical. I already have advantages in knowing what the illness looks like and knowing what to do and having different terms and um, at my disposal. And so um, I'm already so much more ahead of other parents in handling this. But when it comes to finding him care, it has been brutal. One of the doctors we went to was a cardiologist um, because the wait list for a good pediatric specialist was two years in the area. I, I searched like 50 miles and it was like two years. And so we went to see a cardiologist at least because I want to get him an echocardiogram because I could tell he had this autonomia and POTS just from the pulse oximeter that I had lying around that I could test him every day that most parents don't have. I've been able to track those symptoms since day one with the pulse oximeter that we have around the house to, to really track. And then I knew to film it, but I knew they wouldn't believe me. So, um, sorry, can you pause there for a second? What yeah. did you film? What did you film? I filmed, so I filmed him doing like a laying, sit down and standing test just to show the difference of his heart rate. I also had him do a few activities or moving around his body because it's clear he has Piper bots. Okay. To Can show and explain something to people listening. Okay, so was that the NASA lean test essentially? No, it was really more of the. It's I don't. Well, maybe it's definitely not the tilt table. It's just when you take his, you know, go get him into resting, like five minutes laying down, then check yeah, his heart is. rate. Okay. okay. Yeah, so we have it on our website. It's called the NASA lean test. And the thing about POTS is it's postural, right? Orthostatic. So that what that means is that when you change your position, it will trigger neurological symptoms um, such as blood pooling. And then your heart starts beating faster to try and get the blood to your brain um, because we want to maintain blood to the brain. So um, that's what you were checking for. And then you filmed yourself checking it, right? Yes, okay. I filmed it continuously because I know from my struggle when everyone was, it took me, what, several months to get diagnosed with POTS, even though I had hyperpots. <laughs> and it was clear. I was sending all the alarms off and on the, in the ER constantly for my high heart rate, and they just they didn't really care. So um, I knew I was in it for a battle for a child especially knowing that I was going to try to rehabilitate him by the time he actually saw a specialist. So I knew the chances are he'd be in a better condition than then. And so that is why I was like, I'm going to fail him so I don't have to argue with these doctors when I get in here. Um, unfortunately, when I went to the cardiologist, again, I had stabilized him pretty well. I knew to give him the compression socks to help with blood pulling. I knew to increase his hydration when it came to you know electrolytes and getting that salt up to help with the blood volume get to his body. I already knew, you know, he's going to need rest. He's going to need to be as vertical as possible to try to help his body not have so much effort, get that blood there. So I had him doing a lot of resting during the day. Um, so I did, I was able to really get him at a fantastic spot in just six months to get to that cardiologist. Mine's, this is six months just to get to a regular cardiologist, not to a cardiologist that's a specialist for pediatric post viral. That's the, t the wait time that we had here. And so when I went to them and she was like, oh, well, he looks fine. You know, he maybe has his autonomia. I think I want to give him physical therapy and he should drink more water. And I'm like, listen here, uh, ma'am. Um, <laughs> I actually, I, I'm pretty sure I told you that he's always, he's also showing signs of myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. And we know that myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome on top of the pots means that exercise is going to make him worse. In fact, that's what triggered that last flare in him was him who figured out who was running around playing around with friends for like 30 minutes outside until it triggered, it, it was like a domino effect. And so, um, yeah, I, I was like, mm. I was like, how many kids do you see? Like, if you, are you seeing other kids with long COVID and you're telling them this? And she's like, oh yeah, we do this all the time. So when I started asking, I was like, well, how do you monitor them? How, how would you monitor a child with MECFS on top of POTS to make sure you're not overburdening them? Because a kid, especially a professional like mine, is going to push himself and he's going to do whatever. He's definitely a people pleaser. And he's going to push himself to the end. And if you guys don't know anything about anaerobic threshold or stopping, resting, and pacing, you're going to make him a lot freaking sicker. I work way too hard to get here. Okay, so we're talking about uh, associated syndrome. 
um, known as ME-CFS. I have trouble pronouncing it, so I'll let Cynthia say it for me. Myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue Thank syndrome. Thank you. I get it wrong every time. So um, ME-CFS for short. We know in the adult population, I think it's at least 50%, if not higher, of people with long COVID have these symptoms. Is that correct, Cynthia? Somewhere around like 40 and 50%. Around around there. We don't know for children. We don't know how many kids are. We do know that we do have kids in the long COVID community that meet the criteria for ME-CFS. We do know that's happening. The hallmark, one of the hallmarks of ME-CFS is exercise intolerance and post-exertional malaise. Okay, so that's where you exert energy. And then after the fact, you basically crash. It's like you have a faulty, what is it? We say our batteries are a little bit different. I have the condition myself. It's um, our batteries don't charge as well. And we have a faulty charger. And so we have less energy and it takes us more energy to do activities. And when we go outside, what's called our energy envelope, we're using essentially borrowed energy that our body does not have. And so if we do that, we will crash because it's essentially like it feels like you're you're bedridden, like you can't get out of bed because your body's freezing you in a way in an effort to reproduce and replenish the energy. So it gets very confusing because you'll exert energy one day and seem fine, you know, and then hours, if not a day later, if not two days later, your body's like, Whoop, you're out of energy, shut down. Um, we see this in children and it's the most confusing symptom for parents because the general public doesn't know about it. They don't understand their child was as active as can be this morning. Why are they crashed out on the floor this afternoon? What happened? Post-exertion malaise. So long COVID families actually partnered with ME Action, which is an advocacy group for ME, and we created a pacing guide. So we'll include it, a link for it. Um, so it gives parents guidance on what to look, what it is, what to look for, how to manage it. So I just want to say that because what you're saying is very important. Um, exercise has been known to further disable adults and children. Okay. So the message is listen to your body. Just listen to your body. Listen to your ch- children's bodies. If they're saying I was very active and now I've, now I don't feel good. That's a sign to back off. And in children, especially if you pace and you listen to the body, children, oftentimes, if we do this early, start to recover. Okay. I know Rochelle has a good story about that. Rochelle, you want to yeah, we, um, I mean, again, super lucky that early on we we got a lot of intervention, which, you know, my heart really, really hurts for a lot of the families out there that don't, um, because it was so difficult for us. I can't imagine how difficult it would have been if I, you know, if I'd felt like no, that her doctors didn't believe me or that, you know, they didn't see her symptoms or they, you know, we didn't get diagnoses, but um, pretty early on, you know, after after the walking stuff, we, we definitely started seeing, um, you know, could sleep all night, wake up. The first things out of her mouth is I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. I'm too tired to go to school. Um, even getting through the school day, you know, in kindergarten multiple times, I had to basically come pick her up at lunchtime because she just couldn't make it through the school day. She was just too tired. And, um, we would notice that let's say she had a really active and fun day of, you know, maybe playing with friends or running around outside or whatever one day. And she seemed perfectly fine. It would be one to two days later sometimes that it would just be, she'd be completely exhausted. And um, so we, you know, I, I reached out to long COVID families and they, I think they had just created this pacing guide and it was phenomenal. And it, you know, because the thing is my child for well, any children, but also the one, the specific medical condition she already has, she also needs to exercise because that helps with strength coordination, balance, you know, tone, all of those things are incredible. No one's saying like, don't exercise. It's just saying that, you know, when you think about your day, you have to be strategic. And so if, you know, if it's, I don't know, a weekend and, and, you know, we know she wants to do something fun. We want her to do it. We want her to run around the playground. Okay. So we, we call it sandwiching. So we're going to rest a little bit before you're going to have some quiet time and rest. 
class before that activity. We're going to go all out on that activity because she's a typical six and a half year old that wants to run around and, you know, play and do all the things. And then after bike riding or after baseball or whatever, we're bringing it back down at home. And so we don't, and we still don't, this is a year and a half later, we don't have a child that's going to go, you know, go from zero to a hundred and just be able to do it all day. We just don't have that. And instead of trying to force her to be something she's not, or that she can't do, why don't we just say, okay, you know, how are we going to do school and play and all of this? And, um, it, it, you know, we have gotten so used to the pacing and being strategic and thinking ahead that for us, it's just so normal now that I really don't even think about it anymore. It's just, oh, well, she wants to go to that birthday party or she wants to go do that fun thing. Well, okay. So what else are we doing around it? Um, but I think there's a lot of people that don't know. And so they're pushing their kids and, you know, get back into soccer practice and all these things. And the kids can't, they can't do it. And it's further and further harming them. And you do that for long enough and you're not going to be able to bounce back. So, you know, I think the reason, again, she's doing so much better now than a year and a half ago is that we had that guide and her, her pediatrician knew about it and her pediatrician advised us on it. And so did her physical therapist and so did her rheumatologist. And so did, every, you know, everyone we were seeing um, was so helpful. So, um, again, I think had we not done that, it, it would, the effects now would have been so much worse. Right. So, Cynthia, tell us, do you have you been able to get into a doctor? So I did finally get him to a post-COVID clinic in, when was this, the end of a few months ago, we were able to get him to the post-COVID clinic. And that was a battle because they had a rule where you have to have a positive PCR in order to go in there. But thankfully, because I am an advocate, I knew we fought against that. Like we went hard. We knew that this is going to be a problem later that kids who didn't get tested or people that are excluded from being testing and all the testing issues that we're having now that we were going to have a group of people that had the symptoms had needed the help were going to get excluded. So one of the things, us, when I say we, I mean us advocates of long COVID fought for them not to do. And because I knew we fought for them not to do that, I went and talked to the staff again. I was like, listen, you need to send me to your director or whatever. Because um, we asked, well, this being the condition of these post-COVID clinics being open, um, that y'all do not dis you know, disqualify people. And because... I knew that they were like, oh, yeah, we can make an exception for you. But it made me upset because I was like, well, what if I was the mom that didn't know? And then so now I'm screwed. And I don't, I'm, what, what am I going to do? So it, even then, there wasn't even a wait list. They weren't even saying six months. They were saying, we don't know how long we're going to be able to get you in. We will email you one day eventually to tell you then how much longer you have to wait. And I was like, this is an atrocity. Wow, that's terrible. And I did finally get him to get in. He got some testing done. And again, I did such a fantastic time rehabilitating him because I knew what from a lived experience. And I had heard from other MECFS advocates for at that point two years about their child's journey. So I was able to figure out some mistakes that they made and to not make it like, you know, having those, you know, um, that mental. A lot of people don't understand that mental exertion, even in a child, is just as taxing on their body as physical exertion. And so that's really all I got out of the post-COVID clinic because when they referred us out after the test game, where do you think they referred us out to? Oh, I know. The same freaking place with the same doctors that was trying to give him really bad um, advice and, and when it came to um, and, you know diagnosis and, and treatments for his uh, for that. So, like, if you just refer me back to the same hot car ride and then on my own, like, I waited six months just to refer back to the people that I already know are not qualified to be doing this. So, um, my journey continues. I did find a good doctor for the clinic that I am going to already um, that's willing to take him on as a patient, a pediatric patient. And so I can now get all those wonderful labs that was the post COVID clinics can do that a regular primary care provider couldn't do to now send to the, a, a primary, uh, to a, to an actual pediatrician there. But that pediatrician is not a specialist for long COVID. So we're just going to work it together. But, you know, one of the things I knew to do was to ask first, because I know a lot of doctors don't want to take on a complex child and they want to waste my time. So when I was trying to figure out who I wanted to send him to, I had a lot of questions. But first question I asked, do you want to do this journey of complex chronic illness with me, knowing you don't have the background to do so? Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to look at the research? Are you willing to try things together and become a team? She's like, yes. It's like, this is why you're fantastic. I love everything about you. All right. <laughs> so we do have one that we're going through now, but 
How long has it been? What, year? Well over a year? Um, so it has not been great. We're nowhere near a neurologist. Um, we're nowhere near anything that he needs to be seeing. I think he has, um, show, what's it called? Children's? 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 Yeah. Um, even pre-COVID, he's shown sign of that. I really need to get that sussed out. Um, there's a few things that I want to, uh, I know he's got EDS to show me why me having it. And, um, For a second, what's EDS? EDS, yes. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Ehlers-Danlos is a connective tissue disorder, which is why I don't even realize when my hand goes weird like that or can flip it around and all this other stuff. That's not normal. There's nothing normal about that. I thought it was normal because my entire family could do this. So I spent my entire life thinking that this was normal. And when my shoulder blades pop out, it's normal. Or if my shoulder slides out of pocket, that's normal because my entire family does that. And a lot of people, especially people of color, because it's a genetic thing, they think it's a harmless quirk. It's not a harmless quirk because not just that your fingers are bendy, your organs are bendy too. Um, and that can cause a lot of other issues long term if you're not monitoring it and thinking it's just this fun thing that your family can do. And you're actually exacerbating your, your muscles and, and, and harming it more by over rotating it and, and having you more prone to injuries and having no idea. And why, well, she said this, I have it too. So it's, um, we tend to be, prone to um, infection triggered conditions. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we we're now seeing the research that's showing that uh, what was like 30% of us have like ADS and then you know I think when you know when I talk to when you say us 30% you know, of us are you talking about long covid? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm so I'm so used to being a part of the community and that's the only people right, I just around. want to make sure that you know, yeah, of us with long covid. The research is showing up to 30%. I do believe there's like 30% of us, those 30% of those that have long COVID have EDS. And I know Dr. Rowe, Dr. Peter Rowe, who is a pediatric, one of the top, I would say the top, I'm biased, um, pediatric specialist in the nation, been doing this for almost as long as I've been alive, um, was saying that one of the things that he saw as a, a main thing in his journey, in his, I think he's written like 78 research papers or something like that, or been a part of 78 research papers for 30 years, is EDS plus a milk allergy being the main two combinations that we've seen for kids who have to go on to develop post viral chronic illness into. Just to be clear, we're not saying lactose intolerance, we're talking about milk allergy. It's actually a, um, predisposition, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Which my son was born with, which was a, another part of that interesting journey that I, you know, now I understand, like, oh, that's intense. So now that I know more, I can roll back and be like, oh, that's why he had all the eczema and that's why he had all the stomach issues as a baby and he had, you know, there was, yeah. he had like reflux. But I was like, that's fun. So this is probably a good time to share that in the research for pediatrics, the children who seem to be developing long COVID um, are one, ADHD, to um, history of allergies, history of rashes, um, tend to be more prone to developing long COVID. Um, I will say in the community, we see an overrepresentation of neurodivergence generally. And so, and I'm using that word broadly um, to mean anything from autism to OCD, anxiety, like in the broad sense of the word. Um, it seems to be a elevated higher risk. There is also research that shows that hypermobility and Ehlers-Danlos is comorbid with neurodivergence. Um, so that's in the mix too of who we see. Um, and then we see kids with uh, previous serious, serious infections. And so a lot of our kids who don't fall within neurodivergent hypermobile um, usually I, when I ask the mom, if the child's ever been hospitalized with an due to an infection? The answer is almost always yes. And so you'll find out that the 10 year old who developed long COVID was hospitalized for RSV when they were a baby. So there seems to be something about a previous severity of infection that might be playing a role as well. We're now starting to see kids who had multiple COVID infections then that had no other indication that they would develop long COVID joining our community, unfortunately. So, Rochelle, tell us a little bit more about um, your child's journey. How is it going? Where are you guys at now? 
Uh, you mean from from a year and a half ago to now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the journey has been. I mean, I, I think again, you know, for for us, all of the long COVID, the effects of COVID, and the long COVID symptoms are so wrapped up in all the other medical issues she had that for a long time it was very hard to parse out what was what. And, you know, when we would talk with her doctors and and therapists and, you know, we were so concerned with, well, is it from this or is it from that? And at some point, um, you know, one of her specialists said something very wise and said, you know, it it almost it doesn't matter at the end of the day. It really doesn't matter if this symptom is caused was caused by covid or was caused by this disease or this disease or this infection or what. Um, But it doesn't matter in the scheme of things, but it does matter for how to know how to treat it. And that's where I think, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand. I mean, it's very, very hard to get these diagnoses. I mean, again, the fact that she has long COVID in her medical chart is not like something that I like get excited about every day because it's not fun. But I'm also very relieved it's there because um, it helps, you know, when there's an emergency situation or something else is going on, they're going to be able to look and go, ah, you know, but um, it, I would say the toughest thing about all of this has just been knowing the what's what. And and I think many kids have been in, many kids and their caregivers in this similar situation where you've got these sort of bizarre symptoms coming at you out of nowhere that don't really fit into a box. It's not like you're like checking off and it's like all GI or it's all ENT. It's like, a little bit of everything all over the place. Um, you know, like she'd had illness induced asthma before, which meant that whenever she got a virus, she would have asthma flares. And then after COVID, that asthma became chronic all the time. Um, you know, again, you're not going to die from it necessarily, but like, I don't wish that on anyone. I mean, it's just not pleasant. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think now, you know, a year and a half in that we, we have a much better understanding of what, were previous disease symptoms and what COVID did. And that means that we understand how to treat it better, which means we can manage it, you know, day to day, I would say she's doing much better than she was a year and a half ago. Um, But that's been a lot of work, a lot of advocacy, a lot of money. Oh my God. The testing, testing, (laughs) testing ain't cheap (laughs) y'all all this lab work and the imaging and the blood tests and the procedure, like it, it, it's rough. It's rough emotionally, physically, mentally, financially, it's just rough. Um, and so I think to myself, well, it's taken us a year and a half to get to this point. I certainly don't want to know what getting this again would do to her. And it could very likely be completely catastrophic because if you have that kind of reaction after the first infection, it's not like the second one, it's going to be that, it's going to be worse, right? We don't know. Um, and so we're still doing, you know, everything we can to try to keep her safe and protect our family. And, you know, as you know, in the environment we're currently living in where there's, you know, everyone's thrown the mask to the wind, including in schools, including at the doctor's office. It's it's very, very difficult. And, um, you know, we do our best. We do our absolute best. We we go. We do. We're always masked indoors. Um you know, but it's, it's hard. It's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy existence. And, um, you know, I, I don't wish it on anyone. Um, and, um, you know, I hope that the more information that gets out there with how this is affected. And, and, and again, if you saw my child on a regular day, on a normal day, you wouldn't believe me because she looks completely fine. She is bright. She is precocious. She is funny. She is engaged. She's learning. She's fun. She loves her friends place. I mean, you would have no idea. I mean, this is completely invisible disability. Um, and I always say that, you know, you're not going to know on the day she's not doing well because you're not going to see her and you're not going to see her because we're not leaving the house that day. And so, you know, people look and they, they think you're making this stuff up. They think you're crazy. They think, you know, and it's like, no, this is a real thing. And it's something that we have learned to manage very not not so easily, but we have learned to manage it um, and we're just doing our best. And, you know, I, we hope every day that there are better vaccines that prevent them from getting this in the first place, that there's treatments right now. There's very little they can do for kids. I mean, very, very little, especially not for mine. that has got a whole host of other stuff going on. Um, and, you know, we just hope for more treatments and we hope for better vaccines. We hope for better ventilation in schools. Um, because we need that, um, you know, better ventilation, have the air filters are going to keep less of it out or less of it from spreading. Um, and, you know, we're just doing the best we can, but it's, um, it's been rough. It's been really, really, really rough. Um, 
Yeah. So, you know, every time in the media and in just everyday conversations, when people talk about COVID, you know, it's spoken of in like this binary of either you were hospitalized or you passed um, or you were fine. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole spectrum in between and it's rough. And I will say, so um, my story is that I, I got mono twice as a child and it triggered infection associated conditions that mirror long COVID. What it did to me as a child developing disabilities, these infection associated disabilities, is it took away choices. That's what it did. It narrowed what I could do. It narrowed the experiences I could have. Um, I still have, I would describe it as like this beautiful, meaningful life. I love it. But I also have a lot of privilege. Right. And, um, but it, it really, it was a battle and it still was a battle to get the life um, that, you know, I have today. And it's, it, it takes away choices and it adds, it adds complexity. It adds real true physical pain. It adds, um, especially if you don't have access to any kind of um, medical care, it's because I will tell you before I had medical care, it was suffering. And I have the privilege of medical care now. So I'm still disabled, but I don't suffer. And it's a lot of suffering for a lot of our kids. Um, and the other thing is, too, is we are seeing what's most heartbreaking is that we'll see kids just fight their way back from long COVID, just get back into it, get back into school um, after, you know, six months, a year of battling infection and illness and everything. And, and then they get back into school and they get hit with another infection and they're further disabled. And um, I'm really hoping that with advocacy, we can start putting in some, you know, preventative measures so that we can stop that from happening. Um, so now I would like to ask both of you, what do you think, what would you tell, what's one thing you would tell a parent? Um, what do you think they need to know about long COVID? So Cynthia, I'll start with you. What do you think other parents need to know? Oh man. Um, well, it can look, it's, it's probably going to look very different than you expect it to look like. It can take a long time, especially because kids are in their developmental stages, to pin what those symptoms are. And you should know that it's a really, it's a real risk against time. That the sooner you're able to recognize it and get them care and get them stabilized and not make mistakes, that makes them some for some kids permanently disabled or have been from. I, I know some kids that have been bedridden for ten plus years to the point where they can't even see light outside. It's too overstimulating. They can't have a conversation with their parents for ten years. Can you imagine? Um, and in pain every day. And that's not what you want. And it's, it's, it's preventable to get to that level of severity. But you as a parent have to be proactive. You have to be proactive. you got to know your kid's baseline now. Like I tell every parent, find your kid's heart rate, blood pressure now. So that temperature now. So that when something seems off, and they still follow within normal guidelines, you know it's not your child's normal. And that could be the difference between you understanding that there's something very wrong and, or being gaslit by doctors into going down a dangerous path and not. So do not wait until you see those signs. Start taking those vitals now to get that baseline so that you're not just coming out of nowhere. Because with the amount of infections that are happening today um, with COVID, Unless you're living in a bubble like what our family does, and even then we still got it living in a bubble, we still got to go and get labs and all kinds of other stuff. Um, it's going to eventually, COVID's going to visit your family eventually in, in society. So um, know now, have something simple like a post oxymer, it costs like $20, I think, at CVS. Me having it that second that he came in, 
and, and said that and was able to verify with my own eyes something was wrong with him really took the guesswork out of me to try to be to really wrap my head around the reality of of what was actually happening instead of me having a second triple guess okay am i thinking that he's a little paler now am i overthinking this just seeing those numbers reading that screen just to the guesswork out for me there's no you just you might as well just keep it around the house anyways um my son actually enjoyed it one of the reasons like we even saw like i knew his baseline because when i got sick he used to play around with close ox so i knew what his heart rate and, and oxygen levels you know were were before he got into that flare and so that's how i knew how what number to get him to fight back to because his resting is a lot lower than the average kid's natural resting but i would have known that if he hadn't been playing around with that pulse oxygen or, or, or earlier on in my journey and before he you know flared and to have a more consistent long COVID. thank you for that um i'm going to highlight the point that early intervention so incredibly important um it will not only help children recover um, it will help further disability because I don't think a lot of people know that um, that these these conditions, these long COVID conditions, if we're not managing the symptoms, they can get worse. So I, especially when working with kids, I talk about symptoms getting louder and symptoms getting quieter. And so there are things we can do um, to help get the, the symptoms to be quieter. Right. And then there are things that will make them louder. Um, and even if, you know, the thing about, well, are they recovering? I don't know that they're recovering necessarily. It's just we're able to get the symptoms to be pretty quiet. But it takes a lot of um, lifestyle changes and work around it. Um, Rochelle, what would you tell parents? Um, a couple things. I think um, number one would be understanding understanding that there's a difference between not living life at all, like and and living life like there's no COVID. There is a middle ground, and that's just called prevention and mitigation. And I think a lot of a lot of parents feel like, well, if we, you know, are the only ones wearing a mask, then we stand out or, you know, um, how can we not go do all the things? And what I try to explain is the goal is not like, you know, if, if we're human beings and we're living on this earth, we're going to get sick at some point. I mean, unless you're going to wrap yourself in bubble wrap and like literally never leave your house and never have a relationship with anyone, like at some point you're going to get sick, right? I mean, it's it's natural. What I think a lot of us are hoping to get the message across is no one saying don't live your life at all and the goal should be never getting sick. The goal is less of it, less of it, less COVID infections you know, trying to not have that second COVID infection be until we've got more measures in place and we've got better vaccines and we've got treatments for kids and nasal sprays up the nose or whatever it is that they're working on right now. I mean, at this point, I don't care, whatever works, but, um, you know, we're just trying to do our best with mitigation and prevention. And we often feel like we're the only ones in the room that care because we have seen what it's done to our kid for a year and a half and we have no desire to see it again or worse. Um, and so advocating, you know, with your friends, with your PTOs, with your schools, with your workplaces for safer, cleaner air for everyone, not just COVID, but just viruses in general for everyone is a good thing. And, and I wish we could all just see that as like a good thing that helps human beings. Um, that is something that I wish people could wrap their heads around. Um, a second thing would be the importance of having um, a pediatrician, a medical provider, or a team that you really trust and that you feel really knows your kid. Because I've heard, I've had a lot of people tell me, because people talk privately to me about concern. I don't know why, I guess I'm, you know, they know my kid has a lot of medical stuff. So they'll just come to me asking questions. And for a lot of people say, well, the pediatrician's fine, but like, you know, we only see them once a year for a wellness visit. And I don't know, like you find someone, if you can, that you really trust and that you you feel like knows your kid because when you walk in there and, and you say, just like um, Cynthia talked about, you know, tracking, I mean, I, I tracked everything, temperature, food they ate, GI symptoms, sleep, time of day, amount of exercise that, I mean, everything you can think of because the more data, 
the more helps that doctor help you, right? Um, and the importance of being able to walk in and knowing they really knew my kid and they believed me. That's so important. Um, and lastly, you know, you don't want this. You don't want this for you. You don't want this for your kid. Um, none of us know, none of us have any idea right now. You know, we, we get the feeling these are probably always going to be symptoms or things that they struggle with and that maybe they'll wax and wane and we can manage and we can treat to the best of our ability, but we don't really know if this is ever going to go away. And, you know, my kid's only six and a half and, um, you know, I want her to be able to have the fullest, biggest, best life she's able to have. And, you know, for her with everything she already deals with, even prior to COVID, that was going to be a challenge. And now we're adding this on and the future can be a little scary. Um, and I would just say, you, you don't want this. And there's a, again, there's a big difference between, you know, dying in a hospital or having hospitalizations or never needing that, never needing hospitalization, but then this is your life. And, um, love your kids, listen to your kids, do everything you can to prevent and mitigate. Um, that does not mean that you like never leave your house. It just means that you're proactive and smart about doing it. Um, and the last thing I would say is I have found that accommodations or things that would make experiences safer for my child usually are actually really simple and easy. People just don't want to do them. They find that it's an inconvenience, it's a burden. What does it look like to other people? But they're actually not so hard. And so, you know, simply getting groups of moms and parents at your school together and going to your school administrations and, and PTO saying, you know, we want to put a HEPA air filter in all of our classrooms. We want to do it. Who do we talk to? Who do we advocate to? Who do we go to? Um, you know, can we move this event outside? Can we have, you know, if we're going to our house of worship, can we have an area, a, a part of the sanctuary that is masked only so that it's more comfortable and safe for the people that want to be there and need someone wearing a mask? Um, can we advocate to our doctors, our nurses, our healthcare providers at doctor's offices to have waiting rooms that are safer for high risk families and their patients? I mean, high risk, you know, patients and their families. Um there are so many things we could do that are actually quite easy. I've even suggested to people that when you do like, what is it? The e-check-ins with doctors, why can't we have a little button that you can just push that says, I need my provider to wear a mask. I need all, any nurses that interact with me or come into my room to wear a mask. So we don't have to ask because acting is incredibly anxiety producing and it's uncomfortable and there's a power dynamic and it's, it just, it, it's so hard to have to ask medical providers when you're not a doctor to please wear a mask to protect your kid. Like it sucks. And it is like soul crushing in your heart every time you have to do it. And if we could just have a little button that you push during check-in, we can avoid all that. Like there's, there's such simple, easy things we could do um, that I just wish collectively as a society we could do to protect our most vulnerable. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. There's a pattern that I think is worth mentioning that we're seeing in, in, in the community, um, which is a child will get COVID and, and seemingly recover and be fine. It'd be a blip. And then maybe six weeks later gets RSV or flu and they end up in the hospital. Um, there's something, something maybe going on there. Um, research will tell us. But the point is that all of these mitigation efforts help with any respiratory virus. Um, and we're just not designed to get as sick as often as we're getting, you know? And I think your point of like, yeah, we will get sick. It's part of the human experience. And also no one's designed to get sick this often, the way we're currently getting sick. Um, what we see in kids who get COVID is that if they are able to not get another infection for six, eight, nine months, and then they get hit with an infection, it's not as big of a deal. Um, what's really hard is when they get, what we're often we'll see is that they get COVID and then they get um, a viral infection and then they get a bacterial infection and then they get hit with COVID again. And at which point on the other, and that's all within six months, and then coming out the other end, they just are struggling um, and are now are developing all these syndromes. So if your child has had COVID, that's another time to maybe pull it back and just kind of be like, okay, well, we're, we'll just be a little more cautious now. Um, 
you know, kids need three to six weeks. I know that's inconvenient, but that tends to be what kids need to really recover is once they get COVID is three to six weeks of just cutting back on activities and resting. Um, we see better results. Um, we see kids recover stronger when they are allowed to rest earlier. Um, kids who are put back into sports the next week tend to not have as good of outcomes um, in what we're seeing in our community. And we've been watching for three years now, you know, and yeah. So that's, I guess, what I would share. Um, does anybody, I'll open it up though to any final thoughts, any last words we want to share with the community watching? Yeah, just that like post-viral chronic illness is not new. So that's why you see me cringing when <laughs> when you're saying some of these things because I've, I've, I've the stories that I've heard from kids from 20 plus years ago you know, getting an infection, going back to school and sports, having really hard exams, you know, that mental plus physical um, stressors on their body and, and really way, way, way too soon. And from something else like Epstein-Barr virus usually um, triggering the set of symptoms in this horribly disabling life. And if only they knew then what I know. And those kids who are now adults could have had some kind of functionality and wouldn't have everything that they had going for them just stolen. Um, and so I say, this isn't new. Heed our warnings. Take it so seriously because you don't want to kick yourself later as a parent um, for not knowing. You're going to carry that with you. Um for a very, very long time if you're callous about it and then your child ends up disabled and all the things that they fight for and hope for is, is it's not. And then you're having to be the one who sits them down in front of that doctor's appointment and saying, I know you're excited about seeing the doctor, but you're not going to be cured just because you saw the doctor. Our children have a different mindset of what medical care looks like. And to have to that your child's excited to see a doctor, like, that is a really messed up thing to experience when your child is excited to see the doctor. But then it's even worse when you have to say, actually, no, the doctor's not a magician. We're just going there for tests. This is not over. This is the beginning. And, and seeing them have to digest that in elementary school is really, really, really hard, and not something you ever would have thought of a position you would be in as a parent. Of you, you never think of this, even though millions of children have developed this in the past. Because those kids have been so sick, we really have a society talk about the realities, and so you don't want this life. And there's so much devastation. There's times I have to go and just really work hard throughout the day to not sob, not let them see me cry. To see my child go from square and cube numbers for fun to not remembering how to do multiplication. And he's been doing since he was three. And then I had to tell him, no, you're a good boy. I know you're trying so hard. And this is not about you not being smart or, or trying hard. This is this is the illness. This is not you. Um, a real hard day. It's a real hard day to keep your face straight so that you don't know, so that he doesn't know you're as devastated as, and more devastated that he could be um, about doing something that he loves. Like, it's so rare to have a five-year-old love math, and love learning, and to, to have to deny him his potential. Um, it, it's heartbreaking to see every day, to, to say, well, you can do a little bit of math today, but then you have to, you know, you got to sandwich it, right? You know, you can do astrophysics, you can do astrophysics today, but tomorrow you're going to have to go back and do, you know, basic, you know, multiplication or, or light division and not really go and do what he's doing. And at this point, I can tell that he's not going to reach his goal. It's a very, very slim chance now. You know, he's been training to break the world record of, of youngest chess grandmaster since he was like five years old. And that record is, is 12. And um, uh, he's still not to where he was. He was winning trophies. Like every, he was going in and winning trophies. First, second, third. Um, 
tournaments, winning trophies. And now he really struggles to, it's taken us over a year to get him to get through one tournament. So um, it's going to be real hard the day that I have to tell him like, hey, we don't have the time now to do what you've been wanting to do, do your dream. And we're going to have to think about something else. I, I, um, it, it's not a conversation I want to have, but I never wanted this illness to take anything from him, especially when he works so hard. One of one of our my worst times, you talked about like sobbing, and there's been a lot of that over the past year and a half. Um, there was a day where I took my child to school. Um, I'll never forget it. Seven minutes after I dropped her off, seven minutes, I got a phone call from the office saying that I needed to come pick her up because she'd fallen asleep in the corner. And there was something about that. I mean, I was still in the car, like I had not even gotten home. And there was something about when I looked at my clock and I just saw seven minutes, she couldn't last at school for seven minutes. I, I, started crying and I couldn't stop, you know, and, um, and again, we're talking about like a kid who's incredibly bright and precocious and has so much just, she wants to do and give and be, and she's six, she's in kindergarten and she can't get through seven minutes of a day. And there have been, you know, times where she would come to me crying. Um, there was one time where she came to me and she said it was, I guess they'd had PE that day mommy, why can't I run like everyone else? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you know, the other kids, like they can run, like they can go fast and they, they can run for a long time. And, you know, for me, like, said, after a few seconds, I just, I can't do it. It's too hard for me. Why is it so hard for me? And so she's recognizing at such a young age that there are certain things that are difficult or hard and she doesn't understand why. And I can't even give her an answer on why it's not, you know, for some of the other stuff she has, she already can internalize. She's known that she has certain diseases from a very young age, but for these symptoms, I can't explain why. I, I don't know what's going to make it better. I don't have advice to give. I haven't had a lived experience myself that I could share with her and say, oh, this is what worked for me. And there was one day when she said, well, mommy, when you were little and this happened to you, what did you do? And it took every ounce of my being not to cry that I never had this when I was little. So I don't know. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's those moments where it really hits you. I mean, as, as better as she has gotten and as well and well managed that we're doing right now, it hits you. There's these, these moments and these times where you realize, um, how hard this is for them. And, um, and we don't know what the future holds at all. Um, and I would say, you know, not that I want to say there's a positive from having something like this, because I, I don't believe there's a positive for the body. But I will say that where when I went searching for support for from acquaintances, friends, people, you know, I knew from school, my faith community um, could, it could have even been close friends or family. I did not get an ounce of what I needed, like I got from this community. And this community was able to step in and give advice quickly. Do this, see this specialist, run this test. Here's what you, you know, here's the guide for, you know, post-exertional malaise it, it, and jumped in in a way that I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't had. And, um, and I will still say that um, even though people that know me know our lives are harder, they know things are harder, they don't get it and they certainly don't see it. And if you can't see something, it's real easy to tell yourself it's just not that bad. And so having a community that validates and supports and said, oh, my kid's going through that too. Here's what we did. Here's what worked. Here's the specialist we saw. Here's the test we ran. Here's the medicine that helped. Here's the supplement that helped. Here's the this exercise, not this exercise. You know, all of that has been invaluable um, and has really gotten her to the place she is today. And so I just want to say thank you so much to the long COVID family for as tired as you are, because I, I don't struggle with this myself. So I just see it in my kid, but for the adults as tired and burnt out and low energy and exhausted, overwhelmed, 18 doctor's appointments a week, no sleep at night, tearing your hair out as you are, you have been unbelievable in sharing and helping and trying and advocating and getting the word out and getting parents and children information um, in a way that our medical providers can't because they don't know either. Um, and 
I'm just so grateful. I am so, so grateful. And, you know, I, I, I hope that there are, I always say every day, I don't want anyone else to be part of this community. Like, you know, it's not like we want to grow our members, but unfortunately it's going to be happening. It's going to happen. And, um, you know, I just hope that everything this community is gathering and sharing and, and sharing with others and trying to get, you know, money for research and, and, and data that's going to help our scientists and researchers research the things to give us tools to help. But, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole cycle. Um, I'm just hoping that it helps um, because I, I believe there is hope. Um, you know, I've seen my daughter get better over the past year and a half. Um, there is hope and um, there are things we can do to help, but it's, really hard to access it and um you want to try to avoid it if you can you know so um just thank you so much for doing this and and i just i hope that it's helpful for parents out there for school administrators for teachers for you know everyone i just hope it's helpful the infection triggered community and uh, beyond just long COVID, you know, there is, I don't know if most people know this, um, because like we've been saying, when you get an infection triggered condition, you kind of disappear. Um, you fall away from mainstream society, but there, as Cynthia said, there was a community before long COVID. Um, it has exponentially grown, uh, due to COVID, but there's, there were millions of people here before. And I will say it's one of the most beautiful communities I've ever been a part of. Um, as a child, you know, I was a child with infection triggered conditions. And I will say without a doubt that the reason I was able to survive, the reason that I was able to eventually thrive is because of the patient community. So um, I, I, in many ways, they saved me. Um, and so long COVID families is simply paying it forward. Um, because, you know, other people were there for me. And it is a beautiful community. So if you are a parent listening to this and struggling, you know, connect. It just, it makes it so much easier. You know, when you have a condition like this, you end up, it kind of strips you of everything. Like our community is very honest, very real, very genuine. We don't have time for anything else. <laughs> like we just don't. <laughs> And so the relationships you actually make are just some of the most meaningful ones. So um, it's here for anybody who wants to join. You know, you can find us on Facebook um, and then there's the larger community as well. We're all connected in various ways online. So it's easily accessible. So I wanna thank both of you for coming and sharing. Um, I think it's gonna help a lot of families. So I really appreciate it. Thank you.